Michael Lista is an accomplished poet, editor, critic, and nonfiction writer. He's the author of two collections of poetry, Bloom and The Scarborough. He served as poetry editor of The Walrus and as poetry columnist for The National Post. His nonfiction appears in The Atlantic, Slate, The Walrus, Toronto Life, and The New Yorker. Lista is the co-founder of Partisan Magazine. He lives in Toronto, where we are today to discuss, among other things, his book of essays, reviews, and other arsons, Strike Anywhere, published by Porcupine's Quill. Welcome once again, Michael, to the Bibliophile. It's my, uh, it's my hat trick, I think, this time. It's your hat trick, and you know what? I don't think anyone else has achieved that yet. I feel like like Barry Bonds in his uh, in in his <laughs> steroid years, I've I've done something that was seemingly impossible. Well, let's see if you can uh, warrant a fourth. <laughs> so what we'll do, I think, is uh, we'll just go through some of the essays. Sure. In the book, beautiful book. It's very beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about the physical object. Um, yeah, too. like. Uh, Tim Inkster does a does a beautiful yeah, it's job. Yeah, magnificent. And we'll start off with the uh, with the introduction. What I despise about huge swaths of Canadian poetry, a conspicuous environmentalism that masked a deep seated misanthropy, a vain self regard of its own social consciousness, diction and cadences that were more noisy than musical. That's another patented list of sweeping <laughs> dismissal. Yeah, yeah, I'm good at those. What do you have to say about that? Anything more, or does that say it all? Let me, let me start by saying that it's, it's been a long time since I've been submerged in the world of Canadian poetry. And I had a column for the National Post for about five years, and so uh, was consuming like vast quantities of Canadian poetry, which I'm not anymore. Revisiting the book every once in a while, when I when I take it down from the shelf to sort of like leaf through it, or when someone like yourself uh, asks me about it, I find that the person who wrote that book is different than the person I am today. Less angry? Less invested, I'd say. I think what happens when you when you um, have a gig like I did at The Post, and maybe this is just the way I did it, is that you can't help but want Canadian poetry um, to meet you on the terms almost of a consumer. But that's largely who's reading your material in The Post. I mean, I think that's true. There, I think there was a tension. I think there was always a tension between the expectation that I would be something like a curator, yeah, a cheerleader, and that I would be something like a consumer advocate. Yeah, I felt like I was more a consumer advocate. Mm-hmm. I wanted to steer people to the sort of thing that I myself wanted, only because it was like it just felt like that was the only sort of responsible way of handling that responsibility. Ooh, well, um, that's, that's what a good critic does. That's what the critics I adm- I grew up admiring did. I, I think in many ways, I, you know, I realize at the time, I realize it more now, that the source of my controversy was, was that. There is a sense for, um, I think, most of the people in the Canadian poetry world that what a job like mine was really for was was to be like a like a kind of curator an aggregator in many ways of all the iterations of Canadian poetry because it is such a variegated world there are so many different Canadian poetries there is no such thing as Canadian poetry there are Canadian poetries just like our identity in a way i think that's true so what's the connection between the Canadian poetry world and Canadian identity i think when it comes to Canadian identity our strength is our diversity. It's what makes living in a place like Toronto, never mind Canada, great. The sort of, to me, what seems like the false syllogism that tends to get made is then, well, then that that should translate into the way that we appreciate poetics. 
right? That we should, in the same way that we that we should be able to love the variegated ways in which um, we can live as citizens, we should be able to love as as much Canadian poetry as we can. I I simply found that that was impossible. In the same way that I think it's impossible um, to expand the syllogism into, for example, your romantic life. That that just as we should love all our neighbors equally, we should love the whole world and want to marry everyone we meet. I can't do it. I can only love what I love. And say say so honestly. Yeah. I mean I, I found I, I know there are lot there are lots of critics or, or or people who write about Canadian poetry re- reviewers who think it's their job to not take a position to sort of explain um, what a book is trying to do and what merits um, it achieves on its own terms. Contextualize. I, I found myself incapable of doing that. I could yeah. only love what I loved, and I could only be moved to write about to write about the sort of the poetry that I myself wanted to consume. And so it was evaluative then. It, very much so. It did bother me that for lots of people, poetry was first and foremost a um, a form of advocacy. Mm-hmm. I believe enough in issues to think that advocacy should not be left to something as ineffectual as, as poetry. As metaphoric. Yeah, yeah. I think poetry is mostly entertainment. It might be complicated or sort of erudite, niche entertainment, but that's what it is. Canadian literary types are as self-righteous as they are thin-skinned. The backlash to my criticism became more histrionic and more panicked with each review I filed. That's in a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they let, they let me get away with a lot. <laughs> you embarrassed about that? No. Good. No, I don't think I'm embarrassed. It's like, in many ways, I couldn't... I just couldn't help myself. To, to me, it always seemed strange. And I think a lot of the reviewers who, who picked up the book and delved into it, they all picked up on this. People who weren't really in the game that much, who didn't who didn't have a dog in the fight, would always pick up the book and wonder like what like why is there this weird cloud of controversy that's around this book? It's not it's not particularly controversial. This um, uh, strike anywhere. Yeah. It's not I, I don't I don't think it's particularly controversial at all. I mean mm. what it is is it's one person writing about their you know, opinion about which word orders they like. It's a bit more than that. I, I, I'm not sure if it is. I mean, I think it's. I think it's like in many ways, it's like a sort of memoir of my reading over mm-hmm. over five years. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's. It feels like to me in the Canadian literary world, there are always two conversations. There's the public conversation, which is very polite. People wear their white kid gloves, but there's always a second conversation that's always happening. And it happens over email, it happens over text, it happens over drinks and bars. That, that was always, to me, the more interesting conversation because it was more fulsome. And we, we were always all having it all the time. Mm. But very few of us would ever dare to have the same kind of conversation in public that we have in private, which mm. to me seemed silly. It's like, well, what's, what's the purpose of well, doing it? Well, very few people had the platform that you did, too. That is true, I guess, but, but there, there have always been people who have been assigned mm-hmm. reviews yeah. in, in, in major newspapers and most of the time with, you know, with a couple of exceptions most people are, are very reserved and deferential in the reviews and, and wouldn't dare um, air something like an unpopular opinion which always, which always um, baffled me Right. well it didn't baffle you I mean uh, I haven't gotten to the quote yet but the fact that people didn't air their honest opinions was that they wanted to make sure that they got on the right juries and were nominated for the right prizes and that sort of thing. I think that's part of the reason they do it. I think there's also something I, I don't I don't think it's it's necessarily as as Machiavellian as all that. I, mm. I might have I might have laid that case out a little bit too thick. I think in many ways there's a, a good faith approach that they take where they think, well maybe it's sort of rude to say something like that about about someone's book that they worked so hard on for mm-hmm. so long, poured yeah. all their feelings into. Mm-hmm. And there's something that's sort of like un-Canadian about saying something mean about your neighbor. So I don't, I, I don't think I'd begrudge them in the same way that I used to when I was younger. I think they come by it honestly. 
This is from an essay called Publish Less. <laughs> My advice was don't publish. Wait. Read more. Write more. Get better. Good enough to be actually, you know, read. <laughs> Learn to respect the silence you want so badly to break. That was what, to students at... Uh, at Trent. Trent. Yeah. Okay. Any, anything you want to add to that? I mean, I, I still think that's true. Though, I mean, I, I start the essay by talking about the way that, like, I enjoyed and celebrated the first thing I ever published, which was a poem in in a small Canadian literary magazine. I, you know, last week I was published by The New Yorker and I didn't feel as much joy <laughs> and yeah. self-regard being published by The New Yorker at 35 than I did um, getting a poem published that I hate. Hate um, now, you didn't hate, hate then. Hate now. Well, no, I thought it was like, I thought it was like an earth shattering masterpiece. I mean. It, was very much not at uh, at 21 or 22 mm -hmm. or whatever it was I think as you get older or at least as I do like I find writing harder as I get older not easier though I know like I, I think I'm getting better at it but it doesn't feel like it I mean to me the Dorothy Parker line is the instructive one that like I hate writing but I love I love having written yeah. Um, well, you, you uh, in the same essay, you say, writing is hard, and good writing is such like a bourgeois idea. <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, that that's sort of back when we used to argue in Canadian poetry about aesthetics, which we don't much anymore. There was, there was like a sort of a strain of argument uh, that it was uh, sort of elitist to think that certain word orders could be objectively better than others. Um, and that, and that the sort of like in the same way that the that the sort of well-made novel was a, was a sort of middle-class idea that the well-wrought poem was a little more than than like a sort of emanation of class and status. I mean, I I just don't think that's true. I think certain word orders hit you on the nerve endings in ways that others don't. I'm not saying it's the same word order for everyone. But to act as if one isn't more enthralled by poem X for, over poem Y is, I think, to be sort of intellectually dishonest for the sake of, of appearing to be enlightened. And so I don't, I don't go in on that. Okay. You have to unpack this for me, okay? Sure. The post-humanist aesthetic that presently predominates English language verse, which values the elliptical, the runic, the evasively verbose, in which questions of aesthetic merit dissolve in a sociological and stylistic bath, poems that buy into what Ange Malinko has called the new generational text of authenticity to write poems that evade all criteria for a good poem. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so there, so there was, uh, I think there still remains. It's, it's a little bit less so uh, today. There was when, I was, when I was writing that, there was a sense in which the best poem was the one that was the hardest to read. That, I think, has changed. It changed after I sort of like left the poetry scene. You can see the sort of reversal of that attitude in the rise of someone like Rupi Kaur and the sort of like Instagram crowd. Rupi Kaur, I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. It's Kaur or Kaur. What I think is really interesting about her, which I'd, I'd, I'd like to, I'd really love someone to write an essay about this, is, is the uh, affinity that she has in many ways with um, Al Purdy. She is a, a poet who's like very perspicuous, right? Oh, like you, Purdy fans aren't going to like that. Well, what what I mean is that there's the same sense that like that like poetry is should be essentially not all that different from prose, right? That it should be intelligible, perspicuous. It sh it shouldn't be hard to understand. And her 
enormous success, I think is very similar to Purdy's because she sort of speaks to something that Wordsworth talked about, that poetry should be the language of ordinary men. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, she's speaking to young women who are what? Not necessarily angst-filled, but they need someone to articulate the stresses and difficulties they're going through in their lives. Yeah, and I mean, her resonance you know, it, it took place on a social media platform, which mm. it, it really is truly remarkable. I mean, like, she, she has sold, like, millions of copies of her book. I mean, she, she very much is in the sort of, like, lyrical ballad tradition com- of common speech. Um, but for a long time, for a long time uh, in Canadian letters, the sort of ideal mode of poetic, uh, poetic ex- expression was the opposite of that. It was more in the sort of like Hopkins tradition of something that is grounded in sort of like a difficult Anglo-Saxon language um, and that its impenetrability was the sign of its authenticity, mm. which I, to be honest, I dislike. I, I think the poets who mean the most to me are the ones who sort of strike a kind of balance between common speech and sort of lexical um, complications. So people like Haney, Frost, Larkin, Plath, Dorothy Parker, they are intelligible, but they're a little bit they're a little bit difficult. There's a little mm-hmm. bit of hot sauce, yeah. you know? It's or a by, little it's bit by, of mystery or a little bit of something that right. uh, that needs to be looked right. at again. But I never like I was never really a Hopkins fan because I just mm. thought it was just too there was there was just too much sound. Um, I was gonna and not say, enough sense. Uh, yeah, okay. That's interesting. So you're praising Rupi Kaur. Uh I don't want to go on the record saying that. It's not, it's not to my taste. You're just observing a it's not trend. My, yeah, it's not to my taste, but I appreciate that, like, that it, it, in, in, in some ways I feel heartened by the um, idea that, number one, people are engaging very deeply in poetry again, mm. and, also, mm. and also that common speech and common sense are the thing that resonate with people, even people who don't consume poetry. It's but sort of like, to me... It's if, healthy. It's yeah, healthy. If, if it's a gateway drug, that's cool. You know, I hope those people go out and, and pick up more, more, more poetry. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I've been very dismissive of it. But, it's not, it's as not, I say, it's, it's, not so, my, it's, it's not, so popular. It's not my bad. No, but, but it's so popular, and as you, as you say, it's, it's perhaps a corrective. I think so, too. I mean, I think, so the people I grew up admiring as critics, one, like one of them is a good friend of mine now, but, but I encountered him first as a, as a critic, is, is Carmen Starnino, and he was writing essentially against Al Purdy and his and his descendants, mm-hmm. um, who look now very much like uh, like uh, someone like Rupert Cower. That's incidentally uh, that's part of a I, I, I don't know if you want to call it a series of I think it is a literary series. criticism yeah, that Boyd yeah. Defense Group puts out. The Lover's Quarrel you're talking about. That's yeah, the name so of it's his like book. a it's a foundational. It really is. Text. I mean, the first essay in that book is to masterpiece. It, it really is. Yeah. It, the, that that book is 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 a book that um, made me want to be uh, a critic. And it's weird looking back on it. I have no idea. Like it, it was it like, <laughs> you know, when you're lying in your bed as a as a ten year old kid. Lie you weren't reading Starnino as age ten. No, no. <laughs> but you don't you don't lie awake thinking, God, you know what I really want to do one day? I want to be a kid. <laughs> fucking Canadian poetry critic, you know, like, you know, it's not one of I want to make big bucks and I want to be a Canadian poetry critic. Right, it's not one of those things you dream about, but, like, I think for the people who read Carmen's book who weren't, you know, who weren't scandalized by it, Mm. um, uh, they fell in love with it, and they, and they fell in love with what Starnino could do, right, which, which seems even still to be, like, a remarkable intellectual feat, you know, and, and a stylistic feat. Incidentally, I should uh, shout out to John Metcalf, who edited that book. He essentially is the fountainhead from from which a lot of this stuff comes, right? Yeah, yeah. Before Carmen, he was the one who acquired all this stuff. Um, he acquired Carmen. And he still pays attention. Like, I remember the first time I got, like, a handwritten letter from John Metcalf about what I was doing. He wrote me after... Uh, I can't remember which which piece. Oh, I think it was the Don Mackay piece. He wrote me and he was like, I paid attention to that. And he uh, he asked if I wanted to do a book with Biblio Oasis. Um, mm. And I said, my, like, it's a, it's like such a great honor. I grew up reading you. Um, but, 
you know, I already have a book coming out with Porcupine's Quill, and he was like, I, 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 he said something like, well, you're, if, if, if Carmen took it, you're in the right hands. He's just come out with a, another book, big book. I haven't read it yet. Yeah, I've read some of it's it. It's criticism, right? It's, it's the same vein that he, yeah. he writes in about, uh, but it's, it's insightful mm -hmm. uh, commentary on the development of the short story. And, uh, he, I mean, he, like in, in many ways, I feel like um, I, I never read uh, Alice Munro's um, Nobel speech, but I, I, hope, I hope she mentioned him because... Like he he played a large part in like developing the sort of not not just not just the critical language but the aesthetic language of what Canadian prose. He did, became. and Doug Gibson did, yeah. and uh, Robert Weaver, uh, uh, Robert Weaver did too. Yeah. Our literary culture actively encourages for its own survival a writer's worst attributes: vanity, assuredness, sophistry mutual flattery, imprecision, inefficiency, and an unselfconscious fluency that is the surest sign of a <laughs> of a minor writer. Okay. Man, I used to be so mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes for entertaining reading unless you're on the receiving end of it. Well, I, I just I wanted to make it fun. Yeah. Did you do much work on these pieces? Because most many of them appear in the National Post. Did you did you work on them for the book? I mean, you know, this is something that Carmen and I talked about, and one of the criticisms that the book um, ended up receiving, which I, I I don't think is unfair, is that it is a it's a book of short essays, and it's it's very hard to ask someone to read that. Putting together a book of your literary journalism is an, uh, an exercise in being an asshole in many ways. Like, mm -hmm. to be like, here, read, read, read 80 short essays that I, I wrote over five years. I mean, fuck you. That's, that's a terrible thing to ask a reader, which is what I, I sort of opened the book saying. There's this, there's this quote by Jeff Dyer, a writer I really admire, um, who says that this sort of like miscellany is like barely a book at all. And I think that's true. So when Carmen and I were editing it, there was there was like a conversation we had, which was like, well, should we expand some of these? Like some of these are like fucking eight hundred words, right? Well, yes, and some of them, you know, there's a a kind of a a bomb that you throw, and then you and then you piss off. The conversation that Carmen and I had was sort of like, should we expand them or should we keep them as they are? And mm -hmm. what we ended up settling on is that like, the, like almost no one has had the the weird fortune that I've had to be able to write like a column more or less uninterrupted sort of unmolested for mm. five years mm -hmm. right like yeah. they like they just they just let me sort of do whatever I wanted was, was this, this was monthly it was monthly yeah so that's five years monthly that's 60 yeah, columns like 60 columns yeah right it was in a newspaper that that wasn't traditionally known for for its interest in Canadian poetry by any means i mean it's had it's had really interesting literary editors right um noah richler was the was the inaugural editor of the book pages and i think what what the post had tried to do for a while was sort of define itself against the globe's book section which was seen as being sort of obsequious and in the pocket of the publishers Disagree. i mean agree i'm not saying it's true i loved uh, martin levin I, I never worked with Martin. You know, I, I'm not saying that that's necessarily true, but I think that that's what that's what the ethos sure. was, or at least the attitude was. They were they were going to be a little bit more muckraking about it yeah. all, and so it. I think what we ended up deciding was that this should be, especially since like a lot of the pieces ended up being, for whatever reason, uh, seen as sort of controversial. We should sort of keep it as like a kind of document of uh, of, of what it was. You know, do the, do the portrait warts and all, and yep. and so I think it's I think it's sort of like it is interesting to be able to read the book now and to see it for the ways in which it's rushed to deadline, the way that it is in its own way trying to like sort of capture the attention of the sort of Twitter crowd, uh, get people talking, and sort of preserve it for for what the experience of, of doing of doing this column over five years was, which was not one of like necessarily quiet, sober sort of deliberation in the same way that like long form 
literary essays often are. Um, they were just as frequently like hot takes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the, the best part and the worst part about them. It was a weird form. Yeah, I mean, they leave you, as I said, for me anyway, reading it, I thought that you bundled uh, so much stuff into them that I wanted more explanation. But on the other hand, as you say, you're, you've got limited space and you had to get them out under time restrictions. It wasn't just it wasn't just a matter of time though. Like in many ways it was like a matter of, you know, I think I think what what anyone who who sort of writes for money in the sort of age that those essays started appearing realizes is that like one of the things you want to do is is make sure that um, your work is going to be read. And with something like Canadian poetry, you know, the stuff that I and so many of us who were writing criticism about it realized is that the criticism very frequently appeared in uh, small literary journals. But before Facebook, you know, they were read because you had a subscription to ARC uh, or the Malahat Review because you had uh, published a poem in it and so would, you know, get a free subscription for a year and would look at it. And it was mostly like a sort of stayed either generous or politely withholding review. Um, I was not working in those pages. I was working in the pages of, of a major newspaper, and I wanted people to read it. Yes, but as a reader of it, I thought there was some beautifully turned uh, phrases, lots of beautifully turned phrases. Um, but there was also these tight little sentences that contained thoughts and ideas that needed to be expanded upon. Needed to be expanded upon by me? By you, yes. I'm like trying, what? Well, that's what I'm going to try and pull up here. All right. I think like maybe, maybe it was a bit too erudite for a newspaper. I often worried that it was too stupid. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, like, it, in, in the sense that to do, to do a book justice, it's really hard to do in 800 words. You know, or a thousand or twelve hundred words when, you know, my editor was feeling generous or reckless, I guess, and would let me go longer. I think it's really hard to to get to the heart of a book that quickly. For I think sure it's it I think is. it's really hard to get to the heart of anything. Well that's what I'm saying. Words. I think you may have been trying to do that in your eight hundred uh, words in a way that uh, left the reader wanting more. My question always was, like, what is my job? What, what's my what's my function in the literary community? Mm -hmm. If I'm reviewing, you know, a new book by Tim Lilburn or Don Mackay, is is my is my job to to make the final statement on them? I don't think so, and I don't think you can do that in 800 words. And if this is the same Don Mackay that's too beloved to criticize, is that the one? Yeah, that's him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What I found fairly early on is that what I would do is I, if, I, if I put a little bit of English on the prose, if I put a little spin on it, then what would happen is that people would then go to social media and they would argue about it and they would flush it out. And they would, you know, people, people yeah. would say, well, this is what Lista means by this and this is why he's, you know, a fucking total idiot. And no, no, this this might be why he's right. Oh no, actually, he's he's a stone cold fool, and here's why. Um, and I enjoyed that, and I yeah. thought I thought that was good. I yeah. thought that was healthy. What you, you wanted, know? right? Milk toast, um, different splitting reviews don't really do that, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. so, yep. what what made me happy was that people people would talk, right? So. What what I figured was that you know I I would sort of I would su sort of supply, I would supply the booze. The dynamite. I'd supply the booze and the food, right? And then the party would take care of itself. Okay. You know. Okay. Al Purdy is beloved because he's the easiest poet to imitate. Why is he so easy to imitate? Because he sounds like everyone else. Like everyone else in the country, or every other poet. I mean, I think he was trying to sound like, like in the same way that Wordsworth was. He was trying to sound like the local guy in the bar. Yeah, who for some reason thought that beers smelled like what was it? They smelled like farts and flowers or some yeah, bullshit. Yeah, like some that's, bubbly. Uh, 
It's not what fucking beer smells like. Anyways, in the same way that you furnish the commoner, the co- the commoner, that you furnish like your neighbor with a poetic language um, by reflecting his own, you also make your you make your poetry sound like conversation, you know. And when it sort of when it sort of took off. It was like, oh, like the like the only thing I need to do in order to be a Canadian poet is just to sound, you know, to sound like the guy I sit beside at the bar. Um, yeah. And so suddenly everything sounded like poetry, or any passing thought was um, was elevated to to the sort of world of verse, which I I don't I don't think that's what verse is or what it should be. Nick Mount in his book Arrival, mm-hmm. great book, I love yep. it. Me too. Uh, Great guy. He uh, has these little capsule analyses of, uh, or evaluations of, uh, of, of Canadian books. And I think he gives them a, a rating of five stars for works that are world class. And one of them is the collected, collected poems of uh, Alberti. Mm-hmm. So you disagree with Nick? Uh, no. So, so I think that like there, I think there are two, again, this sort of goes back to what we were talking about before. I think that there's like, um, two of the ways that you can approach the evaluation of literature is in the descriptive way and in the prescriptive way. So I think descriptively, um, in many ways you, you have to rate Al Purdy fairly high because, like simply as like a sort of active reporting, it is true that Al Purdy had an enormous influence. Um, I I'm not particularly interested um, in in doing like literary reporting in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I think in many ways that's why academics are so good at it, right? Because they're sort of like this this is what literally happened. So right. Al, Al Al Purdy is an influence on. He's an influence, but what about the poet, poetry itself? Is that what you're getting at? Is well, I don't. It's n- it's not to my particular taste. I, mm-hmm. I think there I think there are so many other amazing poets um, who were Al Purdy's contemporaries, some of whom are still alive and don't get the attention they deserve, Such who as? I think are m- much more worthy. So um, there's Peter Van Turen, who right now is in the process of sort of like like dying slowly in. Um, destitution in a suburb of Montreal um, who... Sorry? He's long dead. Peter Van Turen? No, no. He's, Peter Van Turen is alive. I visited him a couple years ago. Isn't that bizarre? Yeah, I mean, he Peter Van Turen produced like, to me, he's, he's sort of alive. like... Yeah, as far... I, I mean, the I haven't checked in on him for a little bit, but I I went to his little cottage. What happened? Did he finish? He was teaching at Dawson. He he was he hasn't taught in Dawson in I no no, but he he used to, and then what? Yeah. He retired and no. So he hasn't taught at Dawson for I think it's something like um, I, I I would have to double check it fifteen or twenty years or something like that. And I'm not I'm not entirely sure of. You know of of his sort of employment status right now, but from the last I sort of checked, he was not living the way that a poet um, who accomplished so much, who has done so much for Canadian letters, should be living. So he's in poverty. I mean, he's not living like Margaret Atwood or Michael Ondaatje, which I wish he was, because he's a he's a genius. I mean, there are many poets who um, who I think are. Better than Al Purdy, who were his contemporaries. Daryl Hine, for mm-hmm. example, is mm-hmm. one. Um, he died not that long ago. Remember, D- Daryl Hine was also the like. He went edit- to the states though fairly early on. Yeah, I mean, he 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 dropped out of his undergrad, um, was allowed because of how, you know, fucking genius he was to go straight into a PhD. Having dropped out of his undergrad, um, he became the the first and I believe only Canadian editor of Poetry Magazine. Right, like. <laughs> He's he's as brilliant as they get. Robin Sarah is another a Montrealer. Bruce Taylor, you know, all like infinitely more accomplished than than Al Purdy. So if I had to if I had to pick one poet one poet from from their generation 
to be the the sort of representative genius, it would definitely not be Al Purdy. I mean, he's like t- to me, he's like down sort of near like seven, eight, nine, ten on the list. And then there's Leonard Cohen. <laughs> he hailed flowers from Hitler in a letter to his publisher Jack McClellan as a masterpiece. It isn't. He characterized Beautiful Losers, his derivatively Joycean novel that hasn't aged very well, as a religious epic of incomparable beauty. His first book is wonderful, but after that, it's a game of diminishing return. (laughs) But, but, you love some of the lyrics to the future and uh, various positions. This is this is one of those essays that I I that sort of sometimes keeps me up at night. Uh, I, I I I don't think that Leonard Cohen was a very good writer, like at the beginning. Mm-hmm. I think the the point I make in that I think I think when Leonard Cohen discovers the synthesizer, like something radically changes <laughs> in in like in in his oeuvre. Like in his imagination, <laughs> okay. because like what he realizes is that is that like what what makes him great is is putting his kind of like sterling skill for miraculously turned semi biblical oracular phrases, putting them next to like a sort of like Lido bar and hell schmaltz synthesizer sound makes it pop, you know. Um, Flowers, pretty, flowers, harsh. flowers, harsh. flowers for Hitler is a fucking terrible book. Beautiful Losers is a, is not a good novel. The, fu- One of the, the, fu- the future is a fucking masterpiece. Yeah. Death of a Ladies Man when he works with Phil Spector for the first time is is a massive turning point where mm-hmm. he he realizes that putting his putting his sort of like oracular sound next to a schmaltzy or schmaltz adjacent American sound opens up what he's been trying to say about contemporary culture, love, death. It doesn't it doesn't do it when he's when he's just like strumming his guitar right. and trying to sound like a profound like right. Yeah. Yeah, like a sort of earnest folk singer. Mm, mm-hmm. That's not who Leonard Cohen is. Leonard Cohen is the guy on the street corner who is, you know, in a suit, like sort of speaking Ecclesiastes as as someone is making, you know, a ridiculous sound with an accordion, you know. Like, that's who Leonard Cohen is. Leonard Cohen hated his, uh, famously hated his sessions with Phil Spector, thought he was destroying his sound. But when he ended up moving on from it, he he kept it's he didn't keep the wall of sound but he kept the sort of essence of sort of like saccharine schmaltz as the sort of like underlying sound behind it that part of the essay i agree with i just think that like we do this problematic thing with heroes in canada where we when they achieve success in the us we make a hagi- hagiography out of their history leonard cohen my God, it's Leonard Cohen. He needs to be understood not as a sinner US. and not a saint. I, I feel like his work cries out to appreciate the ways in which he fucked up and and to treat him as if everything he did was was some was some divinely inspired act is to massively misinterpret what he was trying to do, which is to try and like show his objection. He's usually popular in Europe. I think it makes more sense that he's more popular in Europe because mm. I mean his his vision is a is a sort of like world historical fatal one it's it's desperate and in many ways like deeply nihilistic even though even though there's like there's always like a sort of there's always a love undergirding it um, he, lust, sex yeah yeah there's a sense in which the world is ending and that's I think that's why the future is so beautiful he sort of like makes a decoration of the end of time this is a poet that a lot of poets know about, but uh, I don't know how many uh, readers of poetry. John Thompson. Oh, yeah. Who you uh, suggest in your essay managed more than any poet since Baudelaire to distill the feeling and the meaning of being intoxicated. Yeah. Yeah, John Thompson is another one of these guys. I mean, uh, or one of these poets, I should say. Not They're not necessarily all guys. I think, I think John Thompson... 
I think he has a, a, a very close affinity with Sylvia Plath. In, in, in Canada, the, the game is a long game, right? You need to appreciate that the community is big. It's not about a pluribus unum. It's, it's not about doing the great, magnificent, singular thing. What it's about is it's about being part of the community for long enough that people will eventually recognize the accomplishment that you have made. America is very different. America recognizes the big sig- singular thing. Britain does in its own way, too. John Thompson only wrote, I believe it was two books. He only wrote one that really matters, which is Stilt Jack. Um, and he did it while he was in the grips of like a like mad, horrifying alcoholism. Yeah. But, it's, but it is one of those things that shines so darkly and so deeply. He, he isn't, like, the, the Canadian book that it resembles most is, is A.M. Klein's The Rocking Chair, the book he wrote before he went silent. It's just like a meteor streaking across the sky. Um, John Thompson killed himself. I think, I can't remember if it was before the book came out, or if it wasn't, it was just after. So he never he never lived to see how much it affected people, and it, it, the the weird thing about it is that it affected people like it never won any great acclaim in its time. I think it might have been nominated for the Governor General's Award. You'll have to fact check this. I don't believe it won it, but it was it was the sort of book that succeeds the only way that books of poetry succeed, which is when poets hand it to one another and say, "You have to read this." It affects the way they write. But again, probably much better known within the poetry community than the yes. greater public. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's sadly true. I mean, I think mm. I think, in many ways, like Sylvia Plath, for example, like mm. she, if she if she had been Canadian, I know this is sort of like the you know the kind of argument where, you know, it's sort of like if the queen had balls, she'd be king. If a frog had wings, its ass wouldn't drag. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, if, if Sylvia Plath had been Canadian, I think that she would have a life and an afterlife like John Thompson, in that he was like a sad, marginal figure who produced this thing of magnificent beauty, which our culture didn't really know how to appreciate, because we're not, we're not good at being able to sort of recognize like the sort of incendiary genius who burns himself out. We like good neighbors, you know? Yeah. Okay, I... I found one of these little bombs. Sure. Beatrice, in you reviewing Clive James's translation of uh, Dante, Mm -hmm. Beatrice died young and Dante died much later in exile from his beloved Florence. But in her, he created literary realism. Yeah. Yeah. In what what sense is it... Is it a bomb, or or it doesn't go far enough? Well, how did she create literary realism? Do you just sort of leave it at that? It's one sentence. So I think the argument essentially is that the you know the weird thing about Dante is that not only like he had done this radical thing by writing in his local vernacular, Florentine. Yeah, but like Luther in German. Yes, which happened much later. Like mm-hmm. we're talking about, we're talking about the thirteenth century, twelfth century. Excuse me. Like epic poetry was not written in the vernacular; it was written in Latin um, at the time in Italy. Right. Um, so, so the fact the fact that he did that in and of itself was a radical act, right? Sure. What's interesting is that modern Italian, as we know, my my family is um, is half Italian. We're from the south. Modern Italian is Dante's Florentine. It's changed slightly, but that's the dialect. Uh, it's a it's a it's a country of dialects. Still in the South, you know, um, my family's dialect is unintelligible almost to to the dialect um, in the town ta- in the town, sort of like just over the hill, right? Mm-hmm. But because he wrote in Florentine, that's what modern Italian is. That's radical in and of itself. Sure. Um, and it's radical in the sense that this is this is this is the language that I speak. That's what Dante was saying, and I'm going to make an epic about going into into the Catholic afterworld, all of them speaking my tongue. And I'm going to punish all the 
dicks that... Uh, well, that's what's so interesting, is that inhabiting the mm -hmm. afterworld mm -hmm. are not just historical figures. As he's led by Virgil, he, he meets Odysseus, but he also meets, you know, that fucking guy who, you know, who, who <laughs> did, he him, did him dirty in, in Florentine <laughs> politics, right? The person who holds the, the <laughs> most sacred spot in heaven is a girl he met. He might not have even met her. It's yeah, just some yeah. girl from his he might town. Have, he might have just seen her. Right. Like, she is, she is the one who guides him through paradise. That idea we take for granted as, as, as being, like, um, something, you know, something that is as unremarkable as the water in which a fish swims. But it's with Dante that that idea first comes, that, like, the person who matters the most is that person that you happen to meet in your daily life. That's, that's where realism comes from. No, a good explanation, but wasn't in your essay. I thought people could get it. Okay. You have a high opinion of people. Uh, no half measures in these essays either. Uh, well, what's the fucking point? <laughs> what's the point of a half measure? No, no, I'm, I'm happy with that as a reader, for sure. Joshua Megan. His second book, uh, Accepting the Disaster, is the most generous, deeply felt, and technically ingenious collection to appear in English in years. Yeah, he's like, he's like Wilbur. He's like Frost. He's like A.E. Stallings. I, I think he and Stallings are the, are the most exciting poets writing today, to be honest. Um, Megan is fucking insanely brilliant. Um, he does the same sort of thing I'm talking about, except the other way around. Like he makes, he makes realism epic. He he turns like a smokestack in the shitty town he grew up in into something that has like mythic consequence, which is like, it's the opposite of what Dante was doing, but it's like adjacent to the same enterprise, uh, which is to connect the um, the secular and the holy. He, that motherfucker can rhyme, which I honestly think, like, there's no point in writing poetry if you don't fucking rhyme. I, like, I know that obviously is enormously controversial, but, like, like why wouldn't you? That's the difference between poetry and prose. Yeah, exactly. And that yeah. son of a bitch can rhyme. It, like, it, I, I rarely feel, like, deep envy reading another poet, but with, like, A. Stallings... And Joshua Megan, I feel it so... And Chris Wyman, I feel it so acutely. I'm like, fuck, I wish I had written this. That, so that, that book what, bowled me over. That's what, motiv that's what will motivate you to write your next book of poetry. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know if I'm going to write another book of poetry. Mm -hmm. No literary genre appears less funny than poetry, <laughs> where conventional wisdom has it that a good poem must move the reader to some epiphany through the subtle revelations of some aspect of the human condition. What does that mean? That's in Why Poetry Sucks. Yeah, I mean, I, again, this, this, this like, I think it has, I think it has something to do with, with my disinterest in um, any poetry that's trying to teach me something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, poetry is not educational. It's it's not it's not a it's not a good vessel for um, erudition. It's good at um, at moving you, um, but not at educating you. Um, and so I I bristle at any poetry that um, that has sort of um, designs on my education. It loses me if it if it um, if it wants to make me better. You also throw in uh, a nice little saying from Christopher Hitchens: "A joke should always be at some <laughs> at someone's expense." I agree with that. Pop that into the. I agree with that. I, you know, you know the the other thing, the other thing, the other Hitchens <laughs> quote that I feel like I should have put in this book, right, <laughs> is that uh, is and and this I live by. Um, uh, he says, uh, a gentleman should only ever be rude on purpose, which... He's moving into wild territory there. Yeah, which I think is true. And, like, mm. I always, you know, if, if, I, if I ever am rude in this book, it's 
it's because I think I mean to be. I, I never try and be discourteous by accident. And I don't think there's anything wrong with being, with being um, mean deliberately, uh, if it's for a reason that I think is worthy. Well, you're agreeing with Virginia Woolf in that regard. That's right. I think I quote that Virginia Woolf line somewhere. somewhere. I think you do, yeah. You also quote to the critic William Logan, who says, don't think what you have to say is important. This I agree with. The way you say it is what's important. That's what you say, what you have to say, is rubbish. Yep. That, that I think is true not just of poetry. I think that's true of like any writing. Mm-hmm. The, whole, the whole game is how you do it. Like All that matters is how you push the noun against the verb. The, the horror of being not just a writer, but of being a human, is that um, your life is almost inevitably a cliche. Even if you do extraordinary things, people have done things that are more extraordinary. Um, and yet you have to experience it as if... It's only ever happened to you. This, this is the problem of not just writing, but of living, which is that you have the overwhelming sense that your experience is novel. And because it's novel, and because um, it's acting on a brain that, um, that has no experience except its own, that your life and all the feelings that attend it are uniquely real. They're not. They're not. You're yeah. derivative. Even, but it's just even, like every even idea has been thought of, of before. All of them. The only thing that can be new, that, and this is the horror of writing, but also its mercy, is that you still can say it in the best way. Right, that it's what keeps literature alive. I mean, mm. why should we write after Homer and Dante and Virgil and Shakespeare? Why should we? I actually think that some, like some people, turn out better sentences than those people. Well, yeah, like not all their sentences. No, are but great. some, but some of them are. About ten percent of them are. Sometimes maybe more. Like I, the the like to be honest, like the like the more I go back to those foundational classics I, I, I get two feelings w- one is holy shit like I can't believe they got so much right well, about, about yeah. my own life but at the same time fuck there are some people I know who can, who can write better lines than this not all of them but some of them are better that is the curse and the mercy of what it means to be not just a writer more importantly to be a reader that there there is even even as you live in cliche, you can escape it by writing something novel. Well, that's why I continue to read new works. Is you're searching for that best. And it's not about what happens; it's about how you say it. Incidentally, I I reread uh, Macbeth not that long ago. So he, did I, actually. He is exquisite on sleep. Yes, his. You know, talking about a sort of a re- refreshing of your life and just the words he uses to describe the importance of sleep in our mm-hmm. lives mm-hmm. is unbelievable. Yeah. In Macbeth, too, there's my... W- one of the reasons, I think, that there is for, for living, for keeping going, mm. even though it's um, used by Macbeth to... Uh, to justify killing more it's also it's also a reason to keep living which is and I'm, I'm not I'm not going to quote it exactly right mm. but but essentially what he says is um, I'm I'm stepped in so deep in blood that that uh, oh fuck no I'm not going to get it right uh, it's it's essentially that like he's he, no you're, stress you're, no stress you can think about it let me look it up yeah so what Macbeth says about killing more, we, we can graft onto why we should live more. Um, what he says is, I'm in blood stepped so far that should I wade no more, returning were as tedious as going o'er. You're, yeah, you're, 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 done, you're, you're so far yeah, into it. That you're up to your you, neck in it. Right. You, might as, you well, may as well go to the finish. You might as well go forward, then go back. That's his genius. His genius is... That in understanding criminality, he mm-hmm. understands um, 
living virtuously. And this is this is the thing. Whoa, about whoa, whoa! What's that again? The genius of Shakespeare is his being able to understand subjectivity, right? Macbeth is able to justify why why he does what he does. He justifies to to himself. Yes, which is which is what we all do, right? That's mm. that's the mm. miracle of the soliloquy, right? Mm. The miracle of the soliloquy is that for the first time you get someone in literature talking to himself, mm. dividing the self into two. The, yeah. the, spe- the speaker and the listener. It's not black and white. He's having an argument with himself or a conversation with himself. He's trying to convince himself. Right. Having done a lot of crime reporting now, what I find is that people who do bad things don't necessarily think that what they're doing is just bad mm. because it's in their self-interest. Which for me, like the only the only subject I'm particularly interested in now is self interest, and it's this, because this is, let's explain this. You've left the poetry scene. Yeah, you are now working as a investigative reporter, or an and that yeah. long form yeah. investigative yeah. journalism. Yeah, is what you're doing. Yeah, now. and why are you doing that now? Why did you move into that? Because of this interest in self-interest? I mean, I think it's like, I think there's sort of a couple ways of explaining it. I mean, I've always, I've always been really interested in, in long-form journalism. There's also sort of like a biographical element to it. So when I, like having, having covered the sort of Canadian um, literary and poetry scene for a long time, I ended up arriving at this story about the Griffin Prize um, yes, and that's at the end of Strike Anywhere. Mm-hmm. It's called The Shock Absorber. Yeah. What motivated you to write that? Anger? No. Um, because it was true. No, no, I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't true, but you must have been, if we could set the stage, you were angered or you were attracted by, what, hypocrisy or the contrast between the aims of poetry and the brutal facts of commerce? The only interesting question is why good people do shitty things. Yeah, because Macbeth was a pretty decent guy to st- starting off in the play. He was, a, in effect... He was a hero. He was a hero, exactly. Yeah. He was a war hero. Yeah. And he did bad things because it was in his own interest. He was influenced by what the witches said. And the question is, did that come from within or without? But he was also encouraged by his wife. The witches were his society. They were his authority. His fate, he thought. Yeah, but they were also, they were in many ways the way the wind was blowing, right? When they were, um, when they were seen as um, oracles, they were, <laughs> they were, um, they they sort of they assumed the 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 position that essentially Twitter has now, as as being as being the heralds of the way the world was going to come to be. Whoa. Uh, Twitter, <laughs> Twitter. Sure, that's interesting. But they possibly were his ambition, his own ambition, spoken to him from some mysterious. They they were they were articulating the way that um, the thrust of society no. might might go. No. Yes, no. of course. No, they were. Sp- they were basically saying to him what he had an inkling of, an ambition. He had a desire to become king. They made that evident to him. They were what 538 is to us. They were a prognostication. They were a prediction. They were that. But they were a know, prediction that he deeply believed in. Sure. In his time, they were called witches. In our time, they're called poles. (laughs) 
they were a no, they, no, were, polls, they were polls, they you were they were they were they were they were an educated guess of what no, he didn't of see what our way. future might be. He didn't see them that way at all. I think he saw them as fed accompli. No, I think they but they were also runes, which is what which is what polls are to us now. I mean they're an educated guess at what at what might happen and we we act on what we think the the sort of received wisdom of our time might be. He was using them as a crutch. No, I don't. No, I don't think that's true because I think he also believed them. I think in many that's ways what they I'm were. Saying. He was he was using them to bolster when he was in difficulty. He he was using them as I'm going to be okay so long as no man of woman born. woman born. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and he was you know, relying on that for his own security, his, his sense of security. The reason why I bring up the polls is that it reminds me in, in many ways of, of what we were all told would, would happen with Hillary Clinton. You know, there was a 90% chance of her winning, right, um, the, the day of the election. There's no way that um, Donald Trump would win until the woods of Dunsinane uh, would move on the castle, right? But they did. What makes the witches relevant is the extent to which our own self-interest colors the news that we get about ourselves. He's shocked when he sees the, you know, the forest moving. He's shaken to his core because he believed what the witches had to say was fate, was the truth. He was relying on them for his, as I said, for his sense of security. Sure. So how does that, how do you rely on poles? You don't rely on poles for that. They're a weather vane, perhaps. Right. But what what the eventual meaning of the witch's prognostication is is that Macbeth reads too much of himself into the only thing that is kind of like the news of his time. Right, the news of his time are the witches. They, in many ways, are no, they're but, sort of they're sort of like journalists. It's only him and Banquo that have actually read the newspaper. Okay, sure. No one else knows about this, sure. so it's a pretty small circulation newspaper. Fine. I mean, like shit. I mean, newspapers, God knows, have small <laughs> circulations even these days. <laughs> but in 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 their in their news, he sees. Like, he, he sees himself optimistically. So how is it possible that the woods of Dunsinane could ever move on the castle? Exactly. How that's, is that fucking possible? It's not. But it's That's not, why it's, he's, but take, it's he's not, taking but solace it's not, in that. But it's not possible because he can't, he can't see beyond the horizon of his own self-interest. Right? It is possible that the woods move. Um, it's, not just not, to, it's just not possible in the way that he imagines it. Could yeah, be. like any normal person would. Sure. But it's about self-interest. Like, that's the whole point, right? Is that you can take for granted, if you hold the castle, that you hold the woods, but you don't. And you don't because you don't understand how other people could subvert the meaning of the best interpretation of your own prognosticating. I think that's why I got into journalism and why I got into... Okay, let's, let's unpack that again. Sure. That's, um, one of, that's one of the witch's cats. It could be. Like another essay I would love to write is the way in which the, the witch's prognosticating has to do with um, the way that we think about climate change. The, wood, the woods not moving is something that we take for granted. It's, it's why the metaphor survives it's reality. 400 years. It's, it's what the real world is. Right, and we like to think that in the world in which we live, the woods don't move. Right. The woods can move. That's, that's the ultimate terror, is that they move and they move against our self-interest. But the reason why we believe that they wouldn't is, is we believe that we understood the world on, on our own terms, on the terms in which we prefer them to be. And in, the, in Macbeth's world, um, he cannot imagine a reality in which, in which the woods move against you. It just has not happened, and it won't, he won't be the one for whom it happens for the first time, and yet it does. Um, this, this is why I'm, I'm interested in journalism, is because 
the reason why most people do, especially crime reporting, the reason why most people do bad things is because they think that, number one, they almost always are acting in their own interest, and they think that the rest of the world will conform to um, to well, the to the fa- to the fallac- to the fallacy of their own solipsism, which is that the world acts mostly in their favor. So, for example, um, uh, in in the very first crime story I wrote, the murderer was this very brilliant guy who was under the misapprehension, though it wasn't unfair of him to think um, that he was right, that he had solved climate change. And he had solved it through this um, this sort of like complicated system of carbon exchange, where he would essentially use algae to capture carbon um, greenhouse gases, and um, and turn it into algae fuel. And um, he was. It turns out he was involved in this like really complicated fraud. His investor found out about it, and um, he decided the best thing for him to do was murder his investor so that the other people giving him money wouldn't find out. Uh, this is real life. Yeah, this is real life. Toronto real life? Yeah, it happened in Oakville, so like a suburb of Toronto. It was a uh, Toronto Life cover story a couple of years ago. And what's interesting about it all is that he, so he killed, he killed his investor. He decided to, with having no criminal record before this, he decided to murder a man in order to protect his own self-interest. And then he thought he was smart enough to get away with it all. Because what? He did such a good job of covering his, his steps? That's what, he th- that's what he thought he could do. So he went through all these, like, you know, all these sort of like complicated steps in order to extricate the body and clean the scene and all this stuff. Clean the it's, daggers. It's impossible. Exactly. It's impossible to clean the daggers. Especially, well, especially the in the thing. modern world. It's impossible to clean your conscience. That's what gets them. Or at least that's what gets Lady Macbeth. I'm not sure about his conscience. He has a some conscience to start with. I think the tra- gets- I think the traditional reading of Macbeth is that what is this dagger that I see before me and the out out damn spot are about conscience. That's the traditional reading. Yeah. I think another reading, I think a crime reporter's reading is that it's also about, and this might this might be a revisionist reading, but I think it still applies, is, is that it's about the inability to get away with it. Well, again, why are they unable to get away with it is because, and it's a bit like crime and punishment, your conscience gives you away. Now, I'm not sure about Macbeth. He's, he gets to a point where he's just going to kill everyone, try and kill everyone. Like, he kills the beautiful little chicks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He, he kills. He wants My to little kill chickens it. in their hand. He wants to kill everyone. Mm-hmm. Yes, I think that's true. Um, but again, there's like, there's like a modern crime writer's way of reading that is, as um, just trying to like get away with it, right? Of like sort of covering, covering up the crime uh, and I to do whatever requires. I don't think he cares requires. about getting away with it. He's the king. Sure, but he but he also doesn't want he he also doesn't want witnesses, right? Mm-hmm. Which is which is why you know well, he hires the murderer. That's right. Yeah, that's right. He didn't do it himself. Sure, if he if he was if he was just the king and could get away with murder, why do you why do you kill Banquo's son? Yeah, that's the that's another big question. Is because he they can don't come have, back and kill you. They in don't the have end children. When he grows up. First of all, they don't. The couple, uh, Macbeth and his wife, don't have any children. And yet, it seems because he's he's killing Banquo's son or wants to, that he has expectations that they're going to have children. I think that's true, but I also think in the sort of modern, like sort of crime writing revisionist reading of it, it's like why leave witnesses? You know, I think I think that stuff carries on into modern life. You do what it takes to get what you want, and. If you're murdering people, you don't want witnesses, right? Right. So yeah. Macbeth is why you got into into. No, uh, not at all. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. Um, I I got I got into um, self interest. That's where we yeah, that's where we I, were about half an hour ago. Yeah, I got I got into journalism. I always consumed it as much as I consumed poetry. By the time my tenure at the National Post was sort of coming to an end, um, there was this there was this big honking fact. Um, that really bothered me um, 
about how the Griffin Prize and its founder sort of uh, had connections to this big Saudi arms deal and how no one really wanted to talk about it because it wasn't really in our interest to talk about it. Um, But I was interested in it. And no one in the Canadian literary world was really interested in my interest in it um, until I applied to the Bant Center Literary Journalism Program with this idea to sort of like look into sort of the Griffin Prize and how it intersected with the with the arms deal and with the and with the sort of Canadian poetry world and what our responsibility. So that's how you was. kind of led to get in there, and they so it said go for it. That's good. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah, they said they we think this is a good story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then so when the story came out, it sort of foreclosed my ability to to sort of be a respectable practitioner of the of the sort of craft in the community um, but it opened doors for me to be able to report which I was happy to do because um, to be honest like I I really like reporting you know the thing that matters in reporting is whether or not you're telling the truth and so if you are they'll let you keep doing it if you don't fuck it up you can do it again you know, there's like in the Canadian poetry world, you can go a long way on bullshit. You, you can't in the journalism world. And I like that. I like that that sense of accountability. So you used uh, your what do you call that? It's not a grant. It's a, what is it? It was a fellowship, a fellowship to identify what? What do, do you I, mean? Well, as I said earlier, you were uh, angry, you were... I wasn't angry. You, you were more than intrigued by the fact that the person who had set up the Griffin Award was producing a product that was used in a weapon that ends up being uh, utilized by a government against its own people and, and also against... Well, it's writers. Against writers, and yeah, exactly, against, yeah. against the poets. So it's, it wasn't it's, even poets. It was no, um, I know that. It was, but it was writer. It was writers. It was um, liberals, uh, feminists, agitators for democracy and mm. liberalism, freedom, the sort of thing that we, by the lottery of our birth, are born accidentally into. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it did. That that did bother me. The armored brigades program, the the Saudi arms deal, I think is a national profanity. I think it's a fucking disgrace. That bothered me. So it was negotiated by a crown corporation on behalf of the Harper government at the time. Yes. But they they did not sign the export um, permits. No, the, it was the Trudeau li- government. The liberals did. Yeah. It was Stéphane Dion. The Spe- deal, hold on, wait, the wait deal hold was on a fait second. accompli, hold on. though. No, no. They, it was not a fait accompli because the export permits needed to be signed. And they were not signed by the Harper government. The person who ended up signing them was Stéphane Dion. Let's put it this and way. Hold on a sec. Hold on a sec. I'm going to tie it into Macbeth. I'm going to. I'm going to. Put, no, I'm going to put. I'm going to tie. The, I'm going to tie this fucking ribbon up for you, Nigel. Let me <laughs> let, do it. Let hold me on, just hold, say, hold on, if Harper on. had been reelected, they would have signed it. No, okay. but it doesn't. That's all I want to say. It doesn't matter. The, li- the liberal signed it. Keep going. Stéphane Dion signed it. I know. And, you know, and and do you remember what he said? Do you remember what words he used when he was asked by journalists why he signed this deal, which Trudeau was equivocating during the campaign about his um, government, uh, whether or not they were going to sign it. You know what Stéphane Stéphane Dion said when he decided to sign it? I think he, he said, said the same thing I did. It was fait accompli. Well, he, but he said the Shakespearean version, which is, he said, what's done is done, which is what Lady Macbeth said. Yeah, she did. That is so interesting because it's such a simplistic little cliche. What's well, done is done. It's so perfect. It's, it's so, and this is Shakespeare's no, no. genius, right? Is that he can, he can say something that seems so simple. But do you know what? The, she said that, but the point is in that play is that it, isn't done by any means. Which is why it's so resonant and true when Dion says it. It's not done. He doesn't have to sign it, and yet he does. This is the whole point of 
this piece, the buck can always be passed. It's mm -hmm. always someone else's problem. And you know what? We'd like to think it's the conservatives' problem. It's mm -hmm. not our problem. Mm -hmm. we're, we're good people. Right. It's not the liberals' fault. The conservatives would have done it anyway. Um, it's, not, it's not my fault if, if, I, my, if my company is involved in um, my, the production of this Scott thing. Griffin, Scott right. Well, or whoever. Or, or like there, are, there are dozens upon dozens upon dozens of subcontractors. Yeah, who can 500, say, I believe. Who, sure, who can say, it's not my fault. My government says it's okay. And so my complicity is deferred to the government duly elected by the people who say this is okay. I refuse to live by that morality. I think that's a disgraceful way to live. I think we need to, to take responsibility for all the things that are done in our name and to obviate our um, uh, complicity in any evil is to act as if we're children um, mm. who, have, who have no, no, responsibility. no, no responsibility. I just think that you can't be a morally responsible person and and think that like evil can be done in your name. I just fundamentally disagree with that. But that, but that makes me that makes me controversial, right? Having morals makes you controversial. I guess so. Yeah. I mean I don't I don't think it should, but I guess it does. Right. Um, okay, so we're talking about self interest. Yeah. And uh, we need to get to the bottom of that. Let's do it. Uh, because that's what got you into long-form investigative reporting. Uh-huh. So perhaps you could tie a little bow on that for me. The, the, the thing that started to bother me about the Canadian literary world is that it felt like our relationship to um, fact, mm. sense, meaning, all the stuff that had been bothering me um, aesthetically, uh, I wanted to see whether or not it extended to something as tangible and irrefutable as our connection to the country's largest arms deal. Would, right. would we be willing to equivocate in the same way about something as, as real and irrefutable as that in the same way that we had been with our nouns and verbs? The answer was yes. So this wasn't, again, about you being upset about not winning an award. Seriously? No, I don't give a shit about awards. I've never given a shit about awards. Okay. I've but, but as I say, that's what Margaret Atwood uh, accused you of. In this, and you, you described this yeah, in I, the to, essay. To be, on, to be honest, I thought, I thought that that line from Margaret Atwood was disgraceful. And I think lots of people did too. For, for four or five, six months of investigative reporting into facts which were irrefuted, mm -hmm. passed a fact check, and are still to this day, three years on, uncontested. That what the what the meaning behind them was was it was it was my my own personal animus at having n not been nominated for a prize that I never cared for anyways, and put my neck on the line to critique. I mean, yeah, to me, it, it makes, it, it's, it's the same argument that Democrats made about um, um, Juanita Broadwick when she, when she brought her, you know, rape her, her rape charge against Bill Clinton, that this was just like a Republican hit job. I mean, mm. to me, that's, that's like pure partisanship. Uh, anyway, you, you, uh, you craft this, uh, this piece at the end of Strike Anywhere mm -hmm. uh, quite beautifully. You start off with uh, the Saudi uh, writer, mm -hmm. Ray Badawi, who gets how many lashes a month for how many months? Well, he gets a thousand, so they di they dish them out, um, I believe, a, a hundred at a time or fifty yeah. at a time or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Far yeah. braver man than me, man. Is he still? He's still around. He's still alive. Yeah. Where is he? He's. You know. Uh, I believe he's in Jeddah. I think. Um, but he's in a Saudi prison for wanting for wanting the life that I get by waking up, and just having been born here. Mm -hmm. So that's how the book ends off. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you think about about the book, Nigel, and about about the sort of journey that the that the book takes? Well, it was interesting. I couldn't read more than one or two essays at a time. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that, no. No, they weren't, they weren't meant to be read one after another. No, not at all. 
and I love evaluative criticism, and I, well, I, I like positive, glowing reviews, and I like really negative, hard reviews, and that's what you get in this book, along with this essay but, but at the what end. I mean, but what I mean is, is what is like, what do you, what do you think of like the journey that it means if you're this, you know, the sort of like kind of critic that I was to take from the beginning to the end. Like you, well, you, you think in some ways that, that I did Scott Griffin dirty. Uh, no, I don't think that at all. I, th I think it's quite easy to attribute your essay to sour grapes or... Really? I think it's easy for many to have done that. Yes. But do you think that that's that that's what I don't I think did that's it? what it is. No, I I, I appreciate your Shakespearean uh, justification for it. I guess what what's interesting is that it it really is an I don't want to use the word compelling because I hate that word. It's a fine way to end this book. That's what I can say. And it's a fine way to end your <laughs> A fine and uh, a fine way to end my career. <laughs> Is that what you're going to say? <laughs> it, involvement, I was going to say, <laughs> with the poetry com community. It, it's also a, an interesting shift into a, a, a new career. It's weird. So, like it, it. To be to be honest, like I I didn't feel like I. I didn't feel like I was earning an honest day's living mm. um, until At the National Post. I mean, it was it was fine. It was fun. It was mm. really fun. That's what I, that's what I put in the end. Mm -hmm. Is that I thank Mark because I thought it was I thought it was really fun to mm. write a column on on books for five years. Yeah. But I didn't I didn't feel like I was like earning my keep until the Griffin story. Right, and um, you wanted to continue to earn your keep. And that's why you've been doing what you've been doing over the last couple of years then, with Trump. Yeah, it feels like, especially like in the age of Trump, it feels radical to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And um, man, there are, there are people who want to sue me every day. I write about scary fucking people. I write mm -hmm. about people who are scarier than the people involved in, in the arms deal. Yeah. Like, I write about fucking murderers. Who Can't, know other people who do murders. Yeah. All the time. That's scary. But it feels it feels like it feels well, good. You've always been a risk taker. I mean, you were with Bloom. That was the whole one of the key ideas behind your book of poetry. I have risk. I have like I have zero like instinct for self preservation. Mm. No, <laughs> like zero. Yeah, you know? but I feel like it's what, yeah. It's but what wait makes a minute. Good at what wait I Wait a do. minute. You're writing about men crying now. So yes, let's just touch on that. Sure, uh, to, let's to, to finish her up. Absolutely. What do you want to know? Well, this proclivity to self destruction. Does it make you cry? Not self destruction. It's not. It's not self destruction. I. I have only um destroy others then no no not at all i mean i i think i think that like i i don't i don't want to i don't want to make myself sound like some sort of martyr or anything like i i take calculated risks but i feel like they're the right risks to take you know well when, um, you've got, when you're trying to get at the truth that's yeah it, it can you know it can be sort of scary luckily of like i don't i my my lack of self preservation lets lets me get close to things that I think are are worth um, telling. The thing with men crying is I'm again it sort of goes back to what we were talking about about self interest. Like I I don't trust self interest at all. The older I get, I think I become in many ways like more Canadian. Like I think that um, the thing that makes this country good is that we obviate some of our self interest into into this idea of a greater good, right? That the reason why we pay high taxes is because it's good to sort of spread it around for all of us. It does us all well. It, Even um, though we've got a Canadian establishment that is defined by self-interest. That's true. And but, I, but I suppose there's also a, a national interest as well with this small group of highly effective 
What, what is the Canadian establishment? It's slightly different than the American one. The it's wealth, more concentrated, I think. I mean, there are, there are like a group of like extremely wealthy families. I'm actually, my next story for Toronto Life is about one of these families, um, which is a, a, like an extremely wealthy Canadian family that's behaving very badly because of money. It, it, it's turned into a morality play. I mean, all the, like, as we've said before, like, all of the stories have already been told. And the horror of behaving badly is that you end up behaving like a cliche, right? There are only so many ways to, to be shitty. There is, behaving... is that a horror because you want to be original? Oh, I think so. I, I would hope so. I, I would hope that, like, if you're, you know, if you're going to be bad, you would do it in, like, a novel way. But it's very hard to do, you know? <laughs> It's very, it's very hard to be... You often don't think about it either. You just do it. The, the, thing, the thing I realize about myself, and it, it took being a book critic for the Canadian poetry world yeah. to realize it, is that I don't give a fuck about calling things out when I think they're bullshit. You know? It's laudable. It's just like, it's just what I do. It's like, it's the water I swim in, you know? Mm-hmm. That's, that's, just, that's just who I am. Um, and I love doing it, and I love getting, I love like getting the chance to do it over and over, and to and to sort of like look, look into the into the pit, and uh, and report back for whoever's interested in listening. Okay, a little bit on the crying, and then we'll call please it, call it a, yeah, call let's it do it. Uh huh. The, the entry point for me was I've just been reading the the Odyssey and. Uh, Man, those motherfuckers a, cry. They, they, just they cry. sit down on the beach. They cry. And they cry their eyes out. They do. They cry and, for themselves. And there's no problem with that either. No, no, no. The 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 idea that men shouldn't cry, as I say in the essay in the New Yorker, is like a very it's like a very recent idea. It's funny because like one of the things that plays a big part in the book is the the erotics of crying, which Augustine yeah. first writes about. He talks about like the pleasure of crying. I mean, I think seeing seeing your like people you love cry is endearing in many ways. Mm-hmm. I always worry that um, there is a utility to crying, which which makes it suspect. You know, uh, among, especially among well, women for, for, or among no, men? for men. For men, you mean men would cry in order or in order to get sympathy from women? I think I think that's one one of the functions that crying has 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 historically had. I essentially what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make a feminist argument for being an old school macho. That's that's the argument I'm trying okay, to make. You need to unpack that for me. I think the reason why Victorians and um, and people like John Ford and John Wayne and Ernest Hemingway didn't cry is misinterpreted as being some sort of like misogynistic macho thing. But if you look at it in the context of the entire history of men crying, it's actually kind of it's it's a sort of innovation. It's it's a progressive innovation. It's woke. They, it's woke not to cry. Yeah, yeah. If you look, if you thought if, it would be the opposite. No, but it's not. I mean, you you're talking about the Odyssey. These guys blubbered like fools. Right. right? No, you see, it's interesting how you call them fools. They weren't fools. They weren't called fools back then. No. They're you're called right. normal. Mm-hmm. Right. And so what I'm saying is that there were two times, there are essentially two times in Western history when it wasn't okay to cry. One was during the Roman Stoic period, and the other was was essentially like our recent past, right. uh, the Victorians and John Wayne and Ernest Hemingway. I think that's the innovation. Look what happened to poor Hemingway, though. I think he lived good. And then he couldn't write anymore, so he said, fuck it, I'm going. How much, how much more did he have to write? He wrote everything. <laughs> like if you if you wrote for whom the bell tolls and old man in the sea what the fuck else do you want to write <laughs> don't be greedy you know like there's okay. there's a, there's a time to put the shotgun in your mouth when you're yeah. 70 and wrote all the things okay you know yeah it's all right you did enough so the crying is the book is going to be called it? the melting mood which is what the melting mood which is what Othello called his tears at the very end, when he realized that he'd fucked up his whole life. Right. His jealousy ruined his life. His self-interest ruined his life. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. And he believed a charlatan, 
who was giving him the wrong facts. Well, that charlatan may have thought that Othello had fucked his wife. Sorry, like we're we're we're, ta we're talking about Iago now. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, Iago was lying. Looking at his motivation, he was overlooked for being promoted. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that Othello fucked his wife. Right. Anyway, so the, the book itself, where, tell me who's going to publish it? Is oh, it's, I, I, I'm not there yet. You know, I make my living doing magazine stories and, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm like working slowly towards it. Okay. Uh, you know. Are you starting off with the Odyssey and moving through world literature or are you, what are you, you going to do? Are yeah, do I think it's going to be, it's going to be like a, uh, yeah, it's going to yeah. be like a mix of like historical excavation mixed with essayistic argument making and then like reporting on on stuff from like uh, men's rights organizations okay so we got the music that means we're going out oh we can sorry we yeah. don't we don't have to no no we can have the music going out okay let's, let's get, get it uh, that's i was enjoying that so uh -huh. you're doing investigative journalism and you're fulfilled with that and you're writing about men crying yes okay so where where else are we? Is there any, anything else going on, or do you want to leave it at that? Because we've had three lengthy conversations on the bibliophile to date. We have. Yeah. We have. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, I think that's yeah. I think that's about it. I mean, you've vented your spleen. I'm happy to have been able to cover a world like like the Canadian poetry world, but I don't. I don't feel like I'm any more of that world than I am of the world of like the murderers I cover. You right, know? Right. Like it's it's a world I was in. You're not invested in it? No. Okay. No. You're observing. And I, and I think that's I think that's the reason why I deserve no longer to be in it. I think there are people who are much more invested in, in what happens with it. I'm yeah. not. Right. I mean, right. for me, it was it was always about the nouns and verbs. Um, it was your youth. Yeah, I mean, it was like it, I I don't mean to diminish it. Like it was. You don't know, for you it, though. It was enormously important to me, and um, I felt like I, I was an adult while I was doing it. In the same way that, like, when you when you do like a big long form investigation, you dive into it. Mm. It's your entire world, and then at some point you have to submerge. Uh, you have to reemerge. Re excuse me. Yeah. Um, yep. And um, and and go and, on and, and, and go on living. And and yeah. have a really good cry. Yeah. That's how we should end this. Let's try and have a really good cry. Cheers. <laughs> Until the next time. Cheers. Cheers. I've been speaking with Michael Lista, and we've been talking mostly about his book Strike Anywhere, published by Porcupine's Quill. Thanks. Again. Thanks, Nigel. Okay. <laughs>